for me, the through line, like I said at, the, at my opening remarks, is about the cultivation of memory. And if Thomas Jefferson and Monticello are the dependent variable, and how various people in the United States make meaning out of, a, uh, out of an estate that he lived in far fewer years than the left. What does that say about memory? It says that memory is a complicated thing. Uh, and certainly, American memories uh, are exceedingly complicated. Uh, this, um, as a, I have to say, as a, particularly as a Jewish filmmaker, this was a difficult film to make. Um, not difficult in the sense of celebrating uh, this magnificent Jewish family that traces their own memories uh, and lineage back to before the United States was the United States. Um, but for some obvious reasons that are pointed out in the film, difficult because of part of the legacy of the Levy family overlaps with the difficult legacy that we grapple with when we talk about people like George Washington and like Thomas Jefferson. Um, right here in this city is, are the manifestation, the physical manifestations of that, of those difficult memories and how we grapple with all these centuries later uh, of, of those legacies. There is so much to celebrate, as we all know, as, as Jews, we all know that there is so much to celebrate, and yet as Jews, we also know how much there is to um, um, question and mourn and be saddened about. Uh, and in the making of this film, uh, I was confronted with uh, those kinds of memories, uh, anti-Semitism that dates far back beyond uh, the 1930s uh, in, in this country and in other parts of the world, uh, memories that go back, again, centuries. And, um, and it was tough to grapple with, I have to say, as, as a filmmaker. Uh, I'm, uh, I'd like to thank uh, as Susan Stein uh, from Monticello, as she says so somewhat optimistically, we'd like to think that racism and anti-Semitism are things of the past, but we all know that that's not the case. And so we all continue to grapple with memories from the past as well as the issues that still confront us to, to this day. <laughs> As uh, Jonathan Sarna, uh, I'm surprised he didn't say it in the interview, uh, discusses the cult of synthesis of American Jewish life. He uh, points out that it may not be so unique to Jews, Italians, Irish. Uh, this idea, this impulse to synthesize, to coalesce one's Jewishness and their sense of belonging in the United States. Of course, the greatest example you can get from the uh, from the documentary is somebody's name is Jefferson Levy. What did you learn about the Jewish fascination with this cult of synthesis? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting how I came to tell this particular story and make this film. Um, uh, there are some folks here in the audience who are familiar with some of my previous films, both of which dealt with the Holocaust. <coughs> But interestingly enough, both of which dealt primarily with certain kinds of American responses to the Holocaust, uh, which involves all different kinds of memory. Um, and uh, as a filmmaker, having, uh, after having spent a number of years working on those two films, I knew that I wanted to continue to tell uh, little-known Jewish stories, but it was time to move away from the Holocaust. The interesting thing about this story is that I certainly didn't discover this. There, there are two folks in the film, Mark Liebson and Mel Yurofsky, both of whom had written a wonderful books about the Levies and Monticello, coincidentally around the same time, around 20 some odd years ago. Um, and Mark and I, in the sort of small Besheret world that we live in, Mark and I had been colleagues as journalists in Washington, D.C. way back in the ancient 1980s, and uh, even though I had not been in touch with Mark for a while, I uh, had a copy of his book sitting on my bookshelf at my home in San Francisco. 
And I have to admit, I, and I have admitted this to Mark, even though the book had been sitting on my shelf, I haven't exactly read it cover to cover. I knew vaguely that it, that it told this interesting, little-known story about the Levies and Monticello. So a few years back, when I was thinking about what I wanted to do next, I was just sort of daydreaming one day at home, and my eyes settled on Mark's book. Uh, and I pulled it off the shelf and reminded myself of what a great story it was, got back in touch with Mark, uh, and told him that I was interested in, in making, uh, making this film, um, and, and, and I was off and running with it. But I also knew that in addition um, to just telling the story of the Levies and Monticello, that I really did have an opportunity, almost an obligation in a sense, to broaden out the story, to bring in people like Jonathan Sarna, uh, and Phyllis Leffler from the University of Virginia to talk about that broader sweep of history uh, as, it, as it pertains to anti-Semitism. And there's one other thing that I also felt the need to do which was not addressed uh, in any great detail in either Mark's book or Mel's book, and that was the issue of slavery. Uh, and you know, people have pushed back a little bit with me on that. Uh, somebody came up to me yesterday when we showed the film at the Whitespin, and she very politely said, well, it was a great film, but did you really have to talk about slavery as much as you did? Um, and I, I was somewhat taken aback. Uh, uh, and as politely as I could, and I'm not always known for my tact, um, I said, you know, um, it turns out you cannot tell a story about Monticello without fully addressing the story of slavery. And unfortunately, as we've just discussed, in this case, also talking about the relationship between a Jewish family uh, and slavery. And w one other point on that, and then perhaps we'll, we'll get some questions from the audience. One of the questions I was always asked, uh, uh, particularly uh, from uh, Jewish friends back home in San Francisco when I was telling them over the last few years what I was doing, there's one thing that a few of them insisted that I find out about, and that was, was there ever a Seder at Monticello? <laughs> well, I hate to disappoint the audience. I, I, I did ask people like Susan Stein and Monticello and others. The Levies were very proud to be Jews, but they were also uh, not particularly observant. Uh, and there's nothing whatsoever in the historical record or in any kind of journals or anything else uh, left a history that suggests uh, there were ever any saviors. But just imagine the irony uh, of a Passover Seder that might have happened at Monticello prior to the Civil War with enslaved people serving up the filter fish uh, while the story of the Haggadah is, is, is being told. I empathize. I was coming out of synagogue just Friday night and somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, great letter to the editor in the choir, but did you have to say that thing about Isaac Leeser in the Civil War? Well, you know, memory and history, they're, they're, they're hard to ignore. Right. So we have a little bit of time for questions. Let's see the, what, again, a round of applause there. Just what a Yes, and please do uh, speak up, and then we'll repeat the question. Uh, I, I, I can speak up. <laughs> uh, first of all, it brought back, it was fabulous. It really brought back great memories. I, I, I was there many, many years ago, and uh, I happened to be there on July 4th. A total accident. I had no idea until I got out of the car in the parking lot, and somebody says, oh, are you here for the ceremony? It's like, what ceremony? And there's Sam Waterston up on the stage doing the swearing in, which was so memorable. Then I was downtown Charlottesville, uh, or Mitzvah, at that synagogue, Beth Israel, and then I saw the mother of Heather Heyer who was killed by that car, and there she is picking up flowers like a year or two after the incident, and she said, this is all I do now, this is my life. I come here to pick up these flowers every week, which is uh, stirring. Uh, my question simply is, were no slaves ever buried on that land? There are, uh, yes, there are enslaved folks who are buried at Monticello. Um, they are unmarked and unnamed. Uh, there is a small area that, that, uh, that was devoted to African Americans 
uh, being buried at Monticello, for many years it was uh, just sort of an afterthought. It, there's now some signage at Monticello acknowledging uh, the burial site. Um, you know, it's an interesting thing about burials and Monticello. And Monticello. For those of you who have been to Monticello, uh, obviously in addition to Thomas Jefferson's uh, tombstone, there is an increasingly expanding area that is devoted to the Jefferson family. Um, no, uh, at no time during the levees' ownership of Monticello did the levees themselves acquire actual sort of official title. In other words, the, the Jefferson family burial plot has always remained under the ownership and care of the Jefferson family and the descendants of the Jefferson family. And they have their own traditions. There's an annual meeting of the Jefferson, the white Jefferson family. Uh, and there has been an ongoing, vigorous debate now that the DNA evidence overwhelmingly uh, proves uh, that Jefferson had children with Sally Hemings. Uh, the Jefferson family burial site remains a whites only burial site. Thank you. The gradations of, of signage and nomenclature, who gets to be named, who gets to be preserved, it's complicated. I mean, one or two more questions. Yes. Have you ever spoken or followed any of the children of Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson? and how they feel about everything? Yeah, uh, I, I haven't. Uh, when, I was, uh, when I was doing the research for, for the project, I, I, I did uh, come across a, a fascinating thing that for a while I explored, figuring out if there was a way to address it in the film, and ultimately it just didn't quite work. But, but uh, it, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting little historical tidbit. Uh, uh, so Sally Hemings uh, had a number of children, uh, with, with Thomas Jefferson, um, one of them, uh, who lived as a, as a, as a freedman um, uh, in, in his later years, married a Jewish woman. Uh, and they lived in Ohio, uh, and they had children. And so we now know with some definitive proof that Thomas Jefferson had Jewish grandchildren. <laughs> um, and when I first learned that, I thought... Every U.S. president does. <laughs> and, and I have to say, when I first learned that, I thought, oh my God, it, you can't, well, you can't make this stuff up. i got to figure out some way. It, it just, it just never quite worked. My film editor and I sort of grappled with, uh, uh, with how to work, uh, work it into the film. So, um, so that aside, uh, I, I, I never have had any direct contact with any of the Hemingses uh, and, and, and those descendants. Uh, there, is these, there is today a, a separate family association. I think they call themselves like the Monticello Association. They are the descendants of the, of the Sally Hemings line, and they have their own meetings, they, they meet. Uh, at Monticello from time to time. You saw the photograph at the end of the film of the descendants. It's, it's quite a, a, a large, disparate group, uh, and they've continued to keep their part of the legacy and, and memory alive. Once again, Monticello making meaning, despair of the different people. Um, one more question, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Preston, an excellent job on this film. I really appreciated it. I loved it as much as I loved the film 50 Children. I know writers never stop writing. I'm hoping you, as a filmmaker, never stop making films. What are you working on next? <laughs> well, I, I sort of I sort of offered a little tease at the end of the film. Some of you may have noticed a, a very passing reference to uh, the Jewish sculptor Moses yeah. Ezekiel, yeah. Uh, yeah. who, uh, among other things, created the iconic statue of Thomas Jefferson that sits that stands outside the rotunda. Moses Ezekiel, by the way, is also the sculptor of the religious liberty statue that now stands outside of the Weizmann. Uh, that, that, that statue was originally commissioned by B'nai B'rith to commemorate the centennial of the United States in 1876. Uh, the story is that uh, he got the commission, Moses Ezekiel uh, lived most of his artistic career in Rome, and created that statue, and it got here too late for the centennial. Yeah, it was supposed to be uh, when there was a big exposition, I think, in Fairmont Park. Um, and uh, so it's bounced around for a little bit, but it's, it's, 
now has this wonderful home. So I learned a little bit about Moses Ezekiel. He's got a fascinating story, uh, including the fact that he uh, was the first Jewish cadet at the Virginia Military Institute. He came from a southern pro and, and fought in, the, in a Civil War battle at Newmarket for the Confederacy. Uh, so he's got an interesting story. Some of his statues are now part of the uh, let's remove these statues because they are Confederate memorials, including one at Arlington National Cemetery uh, in Washington, D.C. So I think there's some rich material about an artist who in his day, late 19th, early 20th century, was one of the most famous sculptors in the world, uh, Jewish and otherwise, and today is all but forgotten. Uh, and I'm hoping to uh, shine a little bit of a, uh, a late spotlight on, on Mr. Ezekiel. Supports my work in theory that everybody eventually becomes an American Jewish historian. <laughs> can I, uh, one last question, yes. Where, where, where can we see this film after today? Uh, this film? Is it going to be uh, distributed nationally? Yeah, right, right now and for the, uh, for, for the next uh, number of months, it really is only being shown on the, fe on the film festival circuit. Uh, uh, my other films have wound up on streaming services like Amazon and HBO and PBS and places like that. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, this film will wind up uh, somewhat similar to that, but for the foreseeable future, only in, only in screenings like this. Our gratitude to Philadelphia Jewish Theater.